I want to say good morning to all of our uh, uh, beloved members and uh, distinguished uh, speakers and moderators of today's CME activity. So every Saturday we have uh, two hours of CME every Saturday of second Saturday of the month, and uh, we picked uh, beautiful uh, topics uh, this uh, month. And uh, these are excellent speakers, and they have experience in what they speak, and also and much more information they're going to give us after the talks. And um, I welcome uh, all the RP members. And this is uh, our uh, another three months left for this administration. And RP has been doing uh, wonderful activities, not only just educational activities, but several other activities, legislative and charitable activities. So I think as physicians, um, we are very content what we are doing uh, on behalf of RP administration leadership, very motivated leadership. And I thank each of my committee members and um, you know my co-partner, uh, Dr. Ravi Kohli, President-elect, and uh, all other officers who have been very supportive this year. And um, without much delay, let us get started with our CME session. And I welcome um, Dr. Ravi Kohli, President-elect, and uh, Dr. Chandra Koneru, uh, who will be moderating the sessions today. And we have two wonderful speakers, Dr. Uh, Jairam Timapuram and Dr. Kunal Desai, and uh, excellent speakers. Welcome to the sessions. And uh, let's get started. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon uh, and good morning to people from East Coast to West Coast. Uh, I'm Dr. Ravi Kohli. I'm a psychiatrist here in Pittsburgh for the past 30 years. I'm the president-elect of AAPI, our beloved organization. On behalf of API, we welcome you all to today's presentation on heartfulness meditation and its health benefits. We have a really distinguished and very accomplished speakers who not only know the theory part, but they practice it and they have benefited from it over the years. They're passionate advocates for this kind of self-care practices which we all uh, need to get involved uh, as this pandemic has showed us that uh, we need to take care of ourselves well if we're able to take care of other people. There is a silver lining for this dark cloud. We all went through some introspection, some uh, kind of a calibration of our values and our goals over the past two years to see where we're heading, how to get there more uh, peacefully and more uh, happily. So without much further ado, let me introduce a couple of um, our speakers. So Dr. Jay Timapuram, a good friend of mine. And uh, Dr. Jay Timapuram is an academic hospitalist in internal medicine in Wellspan York Hospital in Pennsylvania, my fellow Pennsylvanian. He has special interest in research as, and has several articles um, published uh, in medical journals. He's a recipient of Gold Humanism Award, an Outstanding Teacher of the Year and Resident of the Year Awards. He has completed several research projects in heartfulness meditation and its effects on lowering stress levels and burnout and improving sleep. He regularly conducts uh, stress management workshops using heartfulness meditation techniques for healthcare professionals and patients. He's also a TEDx speaker. And our next speaker will be Dr. Kunal Desai. He's from Dayton, Ohio. A lot of good, good people are from Dayton, Ohio, and he's one of them. And he's an infectious disease specialist, and uh, he graduated from uh, Surat uh, Medical College and then uh, trained at Wright State University. Uh, and uh, uh, he's a fellow, he did fellowship in uh, infectious disease as well and he's now currently affiliated with the Dayton Veterans Affairs Medical Center. And uh, he's also a very good speaker and a very, I hear, good singer as well. So we want, he won't be singing today, but uh, he'll be at least enlightening us on the mindfulness and heartfulness and all those aspects of meditation, how we can practice. And uh, so the floor is yours, the, the screen is yours, uh, Jay. And if you want, Chandra, you want to say a few words before we, yeah. Thank you, Anpama Garu and uh, Dr. Ravi. And it's nice to be a part of this group. And you know, for the last couple of years, Api has been doing such a great job in helping the, you know, educating the physicians and also helping the 
patients both in India and, and here. So thank you, Vivan Pumagar, again for your um, nice leadership, great leadership for the last one year. Uh, and thank you for having us here as part of heartfulness. So as physicians, as a group, we are all, you know, compassionate. We are, uh, you know, we have a lot of influence in the community in general. So the, you know, one, uh, like uh, the other speakers mentioned already, the best way to handle stress is when we are more relaxed. When we are relaxed, our responses will be different. You know, otherwise, you know, we'll be more of reactive and impulsive. So heartfulness practice will help us to center ourselves, develop this state of relaxed, uh, relaxed state, and, uh, you know, and maintain that on a regular basis. So, you know, our speakers, both uh, Jay and Punal, they have done uh, their own studies in the American population. Not only they practice heartfulness, they have uh, done the study and published the studies and small but very nicely done studies, they're going to talk more about it. So just uh, one uh, small change, Punal is going to be the first speaker and followed by Jay. So with that, um, uh, thank you for having again and uh, also, one more uh, 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 you know, announcement. We have a small book called Heartfulness Way, and people that are interested, please put your uh, name and uh, and your, uh, if possible, your phone number or address. We can mail that book to you. Heartfulness will send you that book, and there is no cost for that. It's a free offer, so please make use of it. It's a nice, very nice, beautiful, nice book, and people enjoy reading that book. It's one of the Amazon bestsellers. With that, okay. uh, yeah, before the speakers come on board, let me introduce our uh, CME chair, Dr. Ramit Chakravarti, who needs no introduction, but uh, just want him have a few words before we go into the program itself. Amit, uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Can you unmute? Hi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I've... Uh, um, I'm out of town, actually out of the country, but uh, could uh, take this uh, little layover time to join in. Thank you, Ravi, for introducing everybody. Uh, we have got an excellent uh, speaking panel today, uh, like Ravi has already introduced, and uh, we are excited about that. And um, also at the end, I can come in and uh, announce the next uh, month's CME, which we have uh, got planned before. Uh, uh, so please go ahead, uh, Chandra, who is, who is going to be the first speaker. Go ahead and I'll mute myself. All right. It's going to be Kunal. Okay, go ahead, Kunal. If you want to share your screen, you should be able to do that. Thank you. So please put your uh, your names in the chat box. I'll make a copy of the names and we'll, we'll uh, find the addresses from uh, OP office. Yeah. So good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe it's good morning for some, some people. Uh, I'm Kunal Desai. I'm one of the infectious disease physician. And uh, it's an honor to be here to present uh, at the RPCME. So thank you for this opportunity. And uh, before we start, I'll, I'll just give you a quick, uh, quick background of where I'm coming from. Um, so I, as you, as you know, I graduated from Wright State University, did my in, uh, internal medicine training and fellowship here. And uh, now I'm part of the private group practice in Dayton. So I'm a full-time clinician. And I started practicing uh, heartfulness meditation several years back. And I grew up in the family which, who was practicing heartfulness, uh, my father especially. But uh, just like many of you here, uh, I was also a skeptic because uh, we come from an intellectual background. It's, uh, it's, it makes it a little interesting. So, uh, but then now I'm a heartfulness trainer and um, would like to share um, something from something of my experience uh, during this pandemic. Uh, of course, there have been good experiences prior to that, but especially during this pandemic. So just to give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about today, uh, we're gonna talk about stress. And 
it's it's not new to new to us physicians obviously then talk about the current research that was done and published and in a way that uh, in a way how, how heartfulness meditation practice uh, can be a preventive tool uh, in regards to stress and then we'll have some question and answers before uh, before we have dr j's talk so we all know and I have experienced stress, nothing new, but if you want to simplify this, uh, to me, it's a, it's a supply demand mismatch. You know, it's a, if a person perceives that the demands they have exceeds the inner resources they can mobilize to cope with it, uh, then you're okay. But if you're not, if there is a mismatch, then there is some sort of stress inside. Some people they are able to uh, figure that out. Some people experience it, but not knowing that it's there. So is stress something new? No, it's, it's, it's been out there. Uh, you know, that's, these are some data that I want to share prior to the pandemic, where 80% uh, of the company thought that the stress is a top workforce health risk. 80% of the workers thought that the stress is part of this job. And it's nothing new to the healthcare workers, right? So this is sort of the pre-pandemic picture. And what happens? What happens once the COVID uh, started? Uh, you can call it a stress pandemic too, right? And uh, these are some data from US where um, regardless of the healthcare workers, even in the community, 80% of the people thought the pandemic was a significant source of stress. Then we had some uh, repercussions of that in regards to depression and anxiety. Uh, so that increased the rate of mental health problems along the way. There is a meta-analysis that was published in December, from December 2020. And just to show you the prevalence of stress, 40% uh, in the community and depression, anxiety up to 30%, insomnia, because we're gonna talk about sleep today as well. It's close to 40%. CDC published a report on MMWR and they showed that the, the, the rate of depression, anxiety, substance abuse went very high during the pandemic. This was a nice study published sometime in 2020, mid 2020, and they measured the perceived stress score across the globe. And you can see that that's kind of what happened. So this, is a, this was a unique situation where a single organism, because I'm infectious disease, I, we, we are fascinated about bugs, right? So isn't that fascinating that a single organism can spread so fast, so subtle, and can cause stress throughout the globe. To me, I think it just brought our attention to this problem of stress, which was already pre-existing, because probably we didn't know how to cope with it in general. Because we all are physicians here, uh, just to show some data, and I'm not gonna show data for uh, the stress on healthcare workers during the pandemic. We all have experiences this, it's, it's pretty straightforward. But in general, we are twice as likely to experience burnout and stress compared to general population. And the prevalence over the years uh, was calculated to be 85% in a, in a systemic review published in JAMA. And why does it matter? Because it does affect how we care for our patients. So it does affect patient safety quality, correct? This is not new to us, so I will not spend much time here, but we know that stress-related healthcare problems is what we see every day. If you are an internist, that's probably what you see the most. Disease process related to chronic stress, right? Now, let me ask you from an infectious disease perspective, if you are to look back in last couple of years that you have seen your COVID patients, can you think of a single determining factor which can predict the severity of illness? Uh, and not from the disease process standpoint, but from the standpoint of uh, the pathophysiology of it. 
And to me, it is how one's immune system reacted to the virus. It determines the severity of illness. Because we have tried different things and we know that nothing really, nothing really makes a huge impact on the treatment. The, the most important thing we saw was the steroid, but that, you know, we are altering our own immune system with that, right? Uh, so, and stress is, is a single most important factor which determines how your immune system reacts to an outside invader. If it's an unregulated immune system, we get a problem. So that's what we saw in, in last two and a half years. Now, why this is important now, right? One can say that, okay, the pandemic is over, that, you know, things are fine. So why, why does it matter now? So this is a nice picture of, I thought of, uh, you know, that we had that volcano erupted in Pacific. You have the volcano erupting in one part of the ocean and then you can see the um, repercussions going in distant part of the world. So the studies have shown that any public health crisis has an immediate and a long lasting impact on the health and well-being of people. And you can look at the data from 9-11 uh, or other disasters or public health crisis. And, and this was the, the largest public health crisis globally that we have seen in last century probably. So there, there will be repercussions. Now, what would that be? And we are seeing some of it already, right? This was a nice study published in Frontiers in Public Health uh, where you can see the psychological effects right now, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, substance abuse increasing. Then you start getting into this chronic stress-related health problem, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, things like that. And it affects, keeps going and then it affects the social, and it has a long lasting socioeconomic impact. Uh, so that's why it's important that we think about this now rather than later when people have chronic diseases and they are unable to work. So, so what happens? The first thing which, which can happen is a stress and burnout and this applies to anybody in the community and also the physicians. Then we have you know, mental health challenges, then the physical health, and then it affects the relationship, social environment. So if we have to act somewhere, where do we act, right? Now, from my background, and I hope there are some colleagues of my infectious disease here, we think about prevention first. You know, the vaccine comes in our head first when we think of the virus, because, you know, we, we think of treatment for virus, but the basic fundamental thing is the virus incorporates itself into the human cells and becomes part of it. And it affects, uh, uh, affects the whole system, right? We all have experienced it. The same way we have seen, if you think of a stress as a virus, it also incorporates into the human system. And, and we have a lot of studies to explain how it affects our epigenetics. And that's how we, it causes several disease processes, right? So if we have to create some sort of preventive measure, we have to act where things start. So that's where sort of this uh, research was sort of prompted. Uh, one of the other reason which inspired the research that I'm gonna share with you is part of my job is uh, I'm a medical director for employee health for a large hospital network here in Dayton area. And it was a pretty simple job before the pandemic, you know, eight hours a month, and then it became a 60 hours a month when the pandemic hit. And then it sort of gave me a bird's eye view of how our colleagues, healthcare workers were stressed during the pandemic. And it was sort of overwhelming for me uh, how to cope with this whole different schedule and, and different challenges that we had with kids. And my wife is also a physician. So, but I was uh, blessed with this practice of heartfulness meditation, which helped me recover pretty quickly and cope with it. And that sort of inspired this study, I think. So the simple question was, especially during the time of pandemic, if virtual heartfulness meditation program 
would that help reduce stress in general population? Okay, that was a simple question that we ask. I'll share this study with you now. It's, it's, it was a prospective pre post single arm intervention study that was open to public in the United States, including healthcare workers. It was done in September to November, 2020. Uh, the pandemic in, in those eight weeks did not change much. The, the prevalence was still high. And this was essentially open to everyone who was new to the meditation practice. So we excluded who are experienced meditators. We wanted to see how it impacts somebody who starts new meditation practice during this time. So there were, uh, there were several guided relaxation and meditation sessions conducted during the eight weeks. And we asked them to attend at least two of them in a group. Uh, they were, there were presentations done on how to practice heartfulness meditation during the eight weeks. There were, so there was presentation every week. And they were encouraged to practice at home as well. And they were also asked to use is something called HeartSAP uh, that, that you can explore at some point uh, where you can connect with uh, a heartfulness trainer anywhere from the world, uh, sort of anonymously. So from the research protocol standpoint, it's, it was completely fine. And this was offered as an intervention. And I meant, I put this here in, in for everyone who are probably not familiar with the heartfulness meditation practice, there are sort of four <clears throat> component of it and all components were introduced during the study for the participants. The guided relaxation and meditation uh, where we simply ask them to relax and rest their mind in their heart. And there was a second technique where we taught them how to rejuvenate at the end of the day, let go of all the clutter we collect during the day. And at bedtime, again, sort of reconnect in the heart and meditate for five minutes is what was done as an intervention. What we measured was the perceived stress scale pre and post, uh, and also at four weeks in a validated um, scoring system of sleep quality index. We also asked them <clears throat> during the study um, from scale one to 10, how worried they were to acquire COVID infections themselves or someone in the family, because we wanted to see if there is anything change as an external factor, which influences their stress level, right? And then at the end of the eight weeks, there was also a <clears throat> open-ended interview conducted, uh, which was analyzed qualitatively. So we recruited about 63 participants and uh, 36 were able to complete eight weeks of program. And 30% of them were actually healthcare professionals, physicians, nurses. And the, the compliance rate for who completed the study was pretty good. Most of them attended at least two sessions a week uh, and they were able to uh, practice the regimen given. So let's see what we found. What we found was even at four weeks, we saw a decrease in the perceived stress. In eight weeks, it went down further, but it, it was sustained at eight weeks. And this was statistically significant results, as you can see here. Same thing with the sleep. We saw statistically improvement, statistically improved quality of sleep at the end of four weeks and in the, in the end of eight weeks. So that's wonderful, right? That's, that's nice. Um, but of course the study has limitations because it's a single arm study and uh, uh, there are other factors that influences how people react to stress. So there were some limitations. So what we wanted to do is to start, sort of validate the op validate this results of the survey, the stress scale and, and the sleep quality index. And before I share that with you, 
I just wanted to share some sort of theory behind the stress and, and how we thought that the meditation practice can actually help uh, cope with the stress better. And that would help us understand the mechanism of it. Because, uh, you know, uh, again, with my background, if somebody says, uh, the patient often asks, I got this infection, they, all, they always ask me, how did I get it? And how do I prevent it, right? So uh, it was nice to see the results that it works, but then if you understand the theory behind it, it'd be nice. So what causes stress is different, different unexpected events. Oftentimes it's workload time constraints. There are many, could be many reasons for stress. Regardless of the reason, what happens is it's some sort of inner rush, inner turbulence that happens that we often perceive as a stress. The best way to explain this is like a system overload, right? Your brain can handle too much. When um, I was getting all of these calls uh, as a medical director for employee health for um, somebody being exposed and somebody sick at work, things like that, at the end of the day, it's tiring, right? So most of you feel probably at the end of the day, we, we, get, we get tired, it's, the brain can handle so much. It's like a phone battery dies out at the end of the day. That often is perceived as stress. Now here's, a, here's I found is, is, the, is a very important part. When we uh, are having, you know, some of you might be doing shift work. You know, I, many of the ICU doctors work in a shift. Many of the nurses work in a shift. I often ask them uh, and they say it's, it's busy and they are stressed and, you know, it's too much going on. And oftentimes they tells me I'm looking for that, you know, two days off or I'm looking for that one week of vacation. And, and if you ask yourself, most of the time what we seek is somehow we seek, we just wanna take a pause, just get away from things and take a rest, right? But when we do that in those days off or something, it, it's something which is not permanent. It will not have permanent effect. And the second thing is we somehow want to, you know, decompress let go of the things that happened at work or, or anywhere else. Now, sleep is a potent thing that um, Dr. Jay will talk about uh, that, that I'm sure you'll love to hear. But this is important because stress and sleep are, it, it's like a two sides of a coin, right? Um, from scientific standpoint, studies have shown that the HPA axis that gets activated in stress that we talk about, that each player affects our wake sleep cycle. I mean, even, even in a logical sense, if you think about it, can you sleep well if you're too stressed? And if you don't get a good night deep sleep, you might feel stressed in the morning, right? So how can we help both of this? And we saw in the study that not only the level of stress reduced, the quality of sleep improved because of this reason. So to go back to what we seek when we are stressed, we're seeking some sort of pause. It's like, let's just stop for some time, right? That's where the meditation practice can help. And that's what we saw during this study because you are essentially taking an intentional pause to the meditation practice. And the, the very definition of stress is uh, lack of inner resources to cope with the demand outside, right? So this is the way we can turn inward and, and, and seek that inner resources. The end result is once we practice for some time, we learn to stay calm despite of what's happening around it. So rather than we go outside for you know family gathering or or friends gathering and things like that, which are always very helpful to have that social connect. Uh, this way, we can actually every day with the practice, we can try to dig into our inner resources 
to cope with this. It's like solving the problem from inside out. So that's where I would like to share this qualitative analysis because we wanted to know that yes, the meditation practice helped the sleep, helped the stress, but what were their actual experiences which helped us understand how did this happen in the first place? And I'll share some quotes with you uh, from this. The, one of the participants uh, said that it was very helpful to staying calm in the storm. Now, remember, I, we asked them that how worried they were to acquire COVID infection for themselves, for their family. What we found that there was no statistical difference in, in, in how much they were worried during the eight weeks. They were still worried about that. But the way they handled that, that's what changed by the heartfulness practice. And this quotes from the qualitative analysis kind of reinforce that findings. You know, this is another one where um, one of them said, I actually have the power in this to stay calm and observe both emotions in myself and the things around me, which was very helpful. And this was very important to me because this is what we try to convey in the heartfulness practice uh, the meditation practice because that, that 15 minutes, 10 minutes of meditation is helpful, but the key is how it trickles down for the rest of the day, right? Because otherwise it's like you invest something, but there's no return in the back, right? So the meditation done rightly actually trickles down. And that's what this participant shared, that it trickles over into the rest of your life, your interaction with people and then being thoughtful and mindful. And that's, they felt that it was coming from the peace within. So in spite of uh, outward circumstances not changing, they were able to cope with this better. So we, we had all this data from uh, the interviews and we had um, one of the experience researcher analyze this data who's actually not a heartfulness uh, practitioner familiar with the heartfulness practice. And these are the themes that they came up with, that participants' attitude change more positive, empathetic. It, of course, reduces stress. And they were able to stay calm. And they were able to control their emotional reactions and able to accept the situations better. So this helped us understand that, yes, Heartfulness meditation practice helps reduce stress, burnout, but how does this actually happen? It's what we were trying to understand. So in, in summary, in, in regards to this study, the virtual program was very accessible and feasible because they, they didn't have to go out. We had participants from all across the US from different parts, including California. Uh, it reduced stress. It didn't we know that it didn't change what was happening around them, but they were able to accept the situations better. So that's why we, we propose that this could be that very effective preventive measure that we are looking for in order to prevent that issues that we think that can happen after the any public health crisis. This is where we can promote healthier communities. Now, just in the summary, you know, I, I oftentimes observe or get asked um, some of my friends and they ask and say, um, oh, my husband is very stressed. I think he needs meditation or, or my wife, the other way around, right? <laughs> or some of them are like, hey, can you help my kids help meditate, right? It, it, I mean, we, we, we see that. Often I see Jay smiling and Dr. Kuner is smiling. So I, I mean, I'm sure that's not a new question. Um, so the same way as physicians, when we, when we talk to the patients and say, oh, this is gonna be very helpful. Um, I think the first question is probably gonna be, do you practice it, right? So um, I think as physicians, we are all have uh, intriguing mind. Um, 
in skeptical mind and that's kind of where I came from before I experiment with it. And it's an experimental science, you can say that. But unless you experiment with it, you won't know what, what it means. And this is a picture drawn by my daughter. I mean, this is something that she sees us doing and, and she just does it. So what it implies is when they see the other others see you, they just get inspired that way. So the same way if we have to have to inspire our patients, we have to experiment first. So I think um, that's all I wanted to share. And before we go to Dr. Jay's talk, we can take questions now or later. However, I'm not sure, Dr. Kinnear, whatever you suggest, we can do it that way. Yeah. Um, Chandra, you have anything to question, uh, start a question? Uh, uh, members, uh, the participants can uh, ask questions here and we'll uh, kind of uh, put them together to, to the speakers. So go ahead and post your question. Meanwhile, while you're getting ready to speak, let me have a, I was reminded of uh, talking about vaccination and uh, inoculation. There was a uh, uh, process called stress inoculation uh, treatment therapy. First uh, uh, talked about by Donald Meichenbaum in 1980s, how to help people with pa patients with stress. And so you can inoculate the patients with uh, stress by educating them about stress and then getting them some kind of a concept of stress and its reactions. And then um, skills training and rehearsals. And this has been used especially in PTSD in veterans for treatment of PTSD and related symptoms. So it's not a new concept. The stress inoculation therapy has been around. I, I'm kind of reminded of the vaccination. It's just like the virus needs vaccination. The stress needs also vaccination, which is a kind of cognitive behavioral therapy a variant called stress inoculation therapy. So just uh, some of the psychiatrists here might identify with those. That's, uh, that hasn't been talked about as much lately, but it used to be a kind of an important armamentarium in our treatment plans for patients with PTSD and stress-related illnesses. Okay, let me see if they have any question. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a very nice talk, Kunarbhai. Uh, and um, so this is the, you know, the ancient, our uh, Eastern wisdom. He took it as a study and tried to prove it in the public, how it helps in the Western population. This is a nice initiative, Kunar. So there are a few questions that we can, uh, um, you know, address them. So the first question is from, uh, I think Dr. Jayashree. Um, so she's asking, you know, her question is, what is the origin of thoughtfulness meditation? And how is it different from the meditation described in the Yoga Sutras and Kriyas? Kunal, you want to take or Jay? I apologize, I somehow got disconnected. So, okay. The question, Chandra, you want to ask the question again? Uh, Kunal might not have heard it. What is the origin of heartfulness meditation and how is it different from the me meditation described in Yoga Sutras and Kriyas? So, the heart heartfulness okay. meditation um, was originated in India. Um, it used to, uh, it still get. it's called uh, Sahaj Marg. Is, was the original uh, name, and then we know is no more as heartfulness now, but um, it has been out there and offered since 1944, uh, and originated in India. Um, and what was the second part of the question? How is it different? How, how is it different from uh, Kriya and like uh, Yoga Sutras and and. Uh, so I can uh, try to answer that if that's okay, uh, Yeah, so sure, you, please. You know, heartfulness meditation origin, as Kunar said, is from, uh, India, from India. Basically, it is the essence of, uh, uh, you know, um, Upanishads and uh, from Bhagavad Gita. 
So the, the, the principle is to take this divine presence in the heart in the form of divine light and meditate on the divine presence in the heart. So the, you know, in, when you look at the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, there are eight steps, right? Seventh step is the Jhana and the eighth step is the Samadhi. Here we start with the eighth, uh, seventh step, which is on, on, uh, on meditation. And we proceed towards the Samadhi. During this process, <clears throat> you know, our ethical and moral limbs, yama and yama will be regulated. And then the way we sit becomes the asana, the way we breathe and practice pranayama. And then there is something like uh, dharana and pratyahara, where we withdraw the physical senses from outside the world and focus within. This dharana is nothing, you know, something similar to concentration. So that is the product of meditation. So this is from uh, Indian, uh, our, our own philosophy, ancient wisdom, and more simplify, simplified for the present generation. Okay. Next question, uh, Dr. Padmaja Arsumili asked, what is the difference between mindfulness and heartfulness? So this is this is fairly common question that gets asked between uh, what's the difference between heartfulness and meditation. Now, um, one is, of course, I I always practice heartfulness meditation. So, it, you know, it, that comparison is not there. But uh, what I know about mindfulness is is where we have. Um, bring our awareness to our breathing. And that sort of increase our awareness in general. And the way to understand is, if you, if you are aware of your breathing, say in mindfulness, you can actually be aware of your emotions indirectly, and then you can try to control that emotions that way, is how I understand it. Now, heartfulness is a different approach, where we actually meditate on the heart, which is the source of our emotions and feelings, right? And if we can regulate the mind by meditating on the heart, our emotions get regulated naturally. So as a result, our breathing gets nat naturally regulated. We don't have to think about our breathing because now we have, we are able to practice and regulate our uh, emotions so the breathing gets naturally regulated. That's one way I can answer what's the difference between heartfulness and meditation. They are practiced differently. Um, now, the other difference is heartfulness practice is, has different techniques of meditation. One is, of course, where we, what Dr. Conero said, where we bring our attention to the heart and the source of light in the heart and rest our mind there. But there is also another profound practice of rejuvenation, where we actually consciously can remove all the impressions that we collect during the day because of our emotional interactions with others, consciously from, from our backside. And we can talk about this in the future in details, but that is unique about heartfulness because okay. what most people struggle with when they try to meditate, right? Mindfulness or other types of meditation, what do they struggle with most? It's, it's the thoughts that they have during meditation. That's the most common reason why people um, try something and they stop doing meditation. And okay. why, where do the thoughts arise from is our subconscious because of all the impressions that we have collected from, from, our, from, uh, from all the interactions and emotional reactions we have. You know, we have this cognitive memory and emotional memory, right? Cognitive memory is pretty simple. You learn something, but there's a lot of emotional memory we have. And if we can, if we can help that remove it, then we can meditate much better. So, so the heartfulness practice is unique in that way because you can actually help remove all that emotional burden and it helps you meditate much better in the morning. So, so it's, it's, a um, it's sort of a comprehensive approach. Okay. So there are a couple of other questions I want to bring to your attention. One is uh, my good friend, Brahma, uh, who is very knowledgeable. He's a cardiologist, but he's very knowledgeable about mind and med meditation. What is the difference between compassion meditation promoted by Buddha, 
also called meta meditation, as is known scientifically. What is the science behind it? And how is it different from heartfulness meditation or similar to heartfulness meditation? Not Any takers? Uh, Jay or Kunal? Um, no, no, also, can... yes, go ahead. Also, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, the, when you look at the different types of meditation, there are, you know, there are so many techniques. People talk about, you know, talk, you know, walking meditation, music, you know, meditation with, through music and meditation through, you know, even reading and things like that, right? And there is something else they are talking about it. But basically, when you look at these different types of meditation, the, one of them is focused attention, where we intensely focus on one object or a feeling, right? There's one way of, you know, that, there's one technique of meditation. The second one is where they, you know, like a focused, I mean, like the open monitoring, you know, like somebody, you know, someone was commenting about this mindfulness, not being judgmental, thoughts come and go. You no, know, just you, you watch them without paying attention to them and without judging them, feelings in the body, breathing. The third one is the, you know, this compassion, uh, kindness meditation, where they focus on one certain uh, feeling and try to, uh, you know, kind of uh, imbibe that qualities of that feeling into the oneself. And, you know, like, for example, in Christian tradition, they take the, the scripture and read a sentence and then and with love for God, they try to meditate on that. And the fourth one is transcending our own selves. You know, the TM where you repeat the some word and then try to transcend yourself. So in heartfulness, we have all components. Jay was talking about it a few days ago. There are, you know, heartfulness has all these components in a very subtle way. There is, you know, we gently focus our attention on the heart. And I know having this idea that there is divine light, godly presence in the heart, if you, if you will, and uh, try to rest the mind in that thought. Gentle, you know, gentle, uh, subtle idea. During this process, if the thoughts come and go, we do not pay attention to them. We do not judge them. And then, you know, we want to be very mindful and even heartful of our actions and thoughts, how we respond in our day-to-day -day life. You know, I have one, uh, one physician that, that, tells, that uh, told me one, in one of the meetings before he enters into the exam room and before he touch the, touches the door handle, he centers himself, brings his consciousness to the present, brings his heart almost into a prayerful state and then goes and sees the patient, right? So the in heartfulness meditation, we have everything together. All these techniques are put together and sometimes you wonder, you know, how this, how they created this system, right? So that's, uh, these are the different techniques, but heartfulness is inclusive of all these techniques. I'll just add something to what Dr. Kuneru said. When we talk about compassion, empathy, um, we can safely say that there are qualities of the heart because we always define a character of person by their heart. We don't refer to their minds. We don't refer to how intelligent they are. We always refer to the character of a person by their heart. He's kind hearted, he's warm hearted, right? So when we talk about compassion meditation or think of compassion doing meditation, what is the source of all that? The source of all that is the heart. Right. And, you know, as physicians, we know that, um, you know, that AV node keeps beating itself. There's something that which make that AV node beating, keep the heart going and that the whole system goes on after that. So that's, in, in a, in a, that's what we think in a scientific way. But the proposition here is that the source of light is already within my heart. So rather than, um, meditating on the after effects, if you meditate on the source, wouldn't that be better? The second thing is meditation, if you, if you look at it in the dictionary, it would say to, to keep your thought on one object is how they define meditation. But in heartfulness practice, we can define meditation as by meditating for some time on a subtle object, does it transform a person? Does it help in your rest of the day? Then it's true meditation. Because we technically all meditate by the, by the definition of 
what's described in Oxford Dictionary. If you have a sick kid, wouldn't you be thinking about the sick kid even if you're working? You can say that's meditation. But that doesn't create a change. That doesn't create a transformation. So um, when we define meditation, we, if, we, if we, in heartfulness, the unique is we uh, meditate on the heart, which is the source of all the stuff that we talk about all the time. And that results in a transformation. So I hope that I, helps. Yeah, Dr. Shet, uh, Dr. Shet has a comment. Uh, meditation is easier to talk about, but most difficult to practice. So uh, I kind of agree that we all struggle with that. And like you said, your children and everybody wants to learn those things. So any tips on how to, I guess, practice, practice, practice is what you need to do. And a non-judgmental acceptance of your, uh, in your uh, lack of uh, fullness in your meditation, but continue to practice, I guess. That's, I would think as a layman, not an expert in meditation would do. As I said, and, uh, as I and shared Brahma is a cardiologist, but he's asking a question about, Heart is just a semantic, right? It's a, he says everything is mind, mind is brain. So his theory is, uh, interestingly, he's a cardiologist, he knows heart better than anybody else here, but why do we say heartfulness, not uh, something else? Heart is like a, like a GI tract or something, we can say, <laughs> or a, some other part of your brain. I guess my feeling is, historically, culturally, heart has taken the center space of our uh, or existence. So heart has a special place. And um, so that's where I think, like you said, we feel our, with our heart a lot of times. Our emotions are kind of felt there. I mean, the, excel, the agitation or anxiety or fear are more directly felt there immediately than anywhere else. Probably, yeah, you'll be sweating, your skin will be rising and all. But heart touches your heart, <laughs> to, so to speak. So that's my thinking, but if anybody has any better, like uh, Kunal or uh, Jay, please uh, chime in. And that's actually an excellent point that you bring up, uh, Dr. Ravi. There was actually a study that was done, I think by Naman Ma, that was published in, uh, uh, I believe, National Academy of uh, Sciences, where the exact question was asked, to volunteers about where they felt their emotions. There was an overwhelming re response where all the participants put it around the chest, especially around the heart. So that is one thing. There is also a, a, a study that was published by uh, one, one of the PhD guys is uh, the, the Paul Pearsall. The book's name is called The Heart's Code. And this is about case reports of heart transplant patients. And there's one very interesting story that I would like to share. There was this young girl, she was eight, and she received a heart from the donor who was around nine, and ever since this girl received this heart transplant, she started having nightmares as if someone was stabbing her and doing things that should not be done. And it went to a certain extent that the parents obviously got concerned. They took the girl to a psychiatrist and got her completely checked. And they said, you know, this looks much more than just hallucinations. And when they dug a little bit deeper into what happened, the heart that this girl received was from a girl who was actually murdered. And based on the, the, the description that this girl gave, they were able to find out the, the, the perpetrator. There was another story in that, this is uh, the American Heart Association, I believe, was not involved. There are um, PubMed articles that can be seen as well. There was a husband and a wife. They were driving together. And as they were driving together, they had an argument. 
they met with an accident the husband died and the husband was an organ donor and when the when his organ was donated you know obviously the wife uh, was not in a good state of uh, feelings because of what had happened and the, uh, the there was a meeting between the donor and the recipient family and the wife goes to the recipient and she says you know it may sound very silly but i would like to place my hand on your heart or my husband's heart so she places her hand on the heart and says i'm sorry and the recipient says a word that nobody else understands and the wife just sits down and she breaks down and that was a code word between herself and her husband when they reconcile so there are many case reports like this but again it is a matter of intellectualization you know the the truth of the matter is when we start doing something when we feel something that is beyond what we have experienced so far that changes the way we look at things and therefore to me uh, it is a matter of personal experience and to say that one form of meditation is better than the other form of meditation or this is how it works it is all the play of ego to me this is one of the methods that can be tried and tested out and see what it can do either this is something that works wonders or doesn't work that's all right so this, yeah the, the, the debate will continue on about with the yeah. heart is the end organ or the or the main uh, feeling space uh, we don't know so there are many ways to kind of conceptualize it like some people said it's more of a spiritual space right. rather than a physical space heart so we, this can go on but uh, it's a good point uh, i think some people will be asking that kind of question why call it heartfulness and why it is different and uh, other questions uh, that i have no we uh, are not just quickly i know the number of people are asking about you know to they want to learn and meditate there are few right. comments about it so i just want to announce yeah that after jay's talk there will be a medit practical meditation session so please hang in please do not leave stay there it's going to be nice at right. the end we will have meditation yeah so jay will demonstrate a session of 10 15 minutes of meditation very, very refreshing and also we are planning on some kind of follow up session we'll be announcing that also for you all of you to participate and uh, learn more and more so we'll we'll give that information later so you want to go to the next somebody said what is a psqi chain is psqi chain i don't know what dr mahadev up mentioned it any any idea what he is talking about psqi yes to a question there is is it clinically change is it clinically significant in your study at konal the is it statistically significant the change that you have seen in your study yes it's pittsburgh sleep quality index it's a validated scale oh, it's a okay. <laughs> to measure the quality of sleep and yes there was statistical significance okay uh, so sleep quality and quality improved okay all right i think uh, shall we jump into the next part of the topic uh, while we'll be answering more questions after the end of the second talk also Yeah, there is one more question uh, quickly I'll, uh, i'll address this how uh, um, how long and how often do you recommend this practice to be effective in your study you said that you saw some changes at four weeks right kunal you can comment on that quickly what was the question you know when did they see the changes and how long did they meditate so we measured we measured at four weeks and then again at eight weeks um the subjective um experience were recorded at 8 weeks but but on the survey the scales were measured at 4 weeks and there was statistically significant improvement um at 4 weeks as well um so there was one question right and the second and how long do they meditate so they so uh, they we had conducted group guided relaxation and meditation session every day and about 80% of them attended at least two sessions two group sessions a week and um at least 
they were able to practice some of the other practices that were taught. Uh, and and the each session that I'm talking about, that guided group session, is about 30 minutes. And they were asked to meditate as much as they can at home, and also practice the other practices over over the course of eight weeks. And they were able to follow at least 50 percent of them, roughly. Basically, you know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes of a day investment and uh, you see the changes within four to 48 weeks right? okay. yeah. uh, Thank you. Have, one of the things we have to understand from the study standpoint is all these participants who who were willing to try the meditation practice they came with the open mind to try something uh, they were willing and interested to try that and, and committed to try it for the study duration. So that's something when we try to um, apply that information of the study in, into practical aspect, even from individual standpoint, whoever here has not tried meditation before, uh, we, have to, we have to know that their attitude was different. They were, they were looking for something, they were willing, they were interested and they were committed to try for a certain duration. And then they saw the changes. All right. Shall we go to the next topic, uh, Jay? And are you ready with your? Sure. Yes. Okay, thank you. And that was really interesting presentation and excellent uh, discussion. And I'm looking forward to the next part. All right. You're able to see the screen, right? and you're able to hear me okay? Excellent. So thank you Kunal for that uh, presentation. So my name is Jay, Jay Timapuram. I'm an internal medicine physician. I'm going to talk about uh, sleep, meditation and health and some of the studies that we have conducted in our hospital using the practice of meditation that I've been familiar with and that's the heart-based meditation practice. And this is what wanted to talk about, explore the health benefits of uh, a good night's sleep and see what effect the, the practices of heartfulness meditation had on sleep and also identify some strategies to improve sleep and see if we can actually go through a practical session and see how uh, it feels. I don't have any financial uh, conflicts of interest, but I have one disclosure. This is Jasper. And if you hear anything in the background, please excuse me. <laughs> this is a study. Uh, uh, this is a presentation on sleep. So I thought, you know what, why not start with a nice slide of uh, coffee? You know, sometimes at the end of the day, uh, it becomes difficult to take in any more information. When this traffic of information keeps coming in, and there, there is a point where we feel that any kind of information that comes in is only causing that overload. You know, if we look at it from a neurological point of view, right? Our, our neurons, they do swell up a little bit with all the incoming traffic of information. And you know what brings those neurons back to a normal uh, size? A rest for the mind. And nature offers it every night through a good night's sleep. But unfortunately, we are the only species on this planet who voluntarily sleep deprive ourselves. No other species on this planet does that. But what happens when we sleep deprive ourselves, right? You know, there was a very nice study that was done on volunteers where they were sleep deprived. And as they were sleep deprived, we saw that even features of psychosis started to show up and this tells us that sleep is not only beneficial for our rejuvenation purposes but also for our mental health for our emotional health it is absolutely important and if we take sleep into consideration you no know, it can be divided into two halves when we go to bed at night 
and we wake up in the morning, if we divide that whole part into two halves, the first half of the night and the second half of the night, right? The first half of the night is predominantly rich in the non-REM sleep, the non-rapid eye movement sleep, and the second half of the sleep is rich in, in the REM sleep, right? And REM sleep is where we have, um, most of the dreaming happens during that time, right? When we wake up very early in the morning, as adults, we may feel groggy or grumpy and uh, you know, may not feel very good. But imagine kids being woken up very early in the morning, right? When they're woken up very early in the morning, they're deprived of this dream rich sleep or the REM sleep. And when, we, when these kids go to school, for instance, can they sit still, can they focus, can they pay attention? And if they're unable to sit still, if they're unable to pay attention, if they're unable to, uh, to, to, to answer the questions, and if their behavior is not so good, often the parents may get a report from the teacher to get this kid checked out, right? And as, as physicians, as, as pediatricians, right? when we see these children, one of the things that we may need to consider is sleep. Trying to elicit this sleep history is very important. Maybe all that this kid needs is, is a good night's sleep, right? The, most of these symptoms, they do mimic ADHD, right? So it is important to tease out this, this important difference between sleep deprivation that leads to certain symptoms versus ADHD, right? And in fact, there are some studies that actually show that promoting sleep in children can actually help with symptoms that, are, that, that can be troublesome in ADHD. There are many health benefits of sleep that I can talk about. You know, most of us, we would like to have a healthy memory, a good memory, something that we can use in our lives, right? something that we, we, we can have a good cognitive function for a longer lifespan. You know, when we learn something new during the daytime, do you know how that gets consolidated? It gets consolidated during sleep. It is only through a good night's sleep that we are able to consolidate it and, and make it usable for the next day. You know, there were studies where students were taught where one group of students were sleep deprived and the other group received a good sleep. The, the group that received a good sleep actually performed much better. And the consolidation of that memory happened much better. And we talked about attention, right? Attention deficit hyperactivity syndrome that we talked about on the earlier side. Imagine a night that you have slept very well. In the morning, it's much easier for you to pay attention. And imagine a night that you have not slept well. In the morning, it's difficult to pay attention. It's difficult to focus. And the other thing is when we have a poor night's sleep, it makes us susceptible to stress. Our perception of stress, our sensitivity to stress increases. And some of us, we're also conscious of our weight. We would like to have a healthy weight, right? No, when we have a poor night's sleep, there is, an, there is a problem with craving. And there was a study that was done where a group of participants were divided into two. One group received good night's sleep and the second group were sleep deprived. And in the morning, they were all given equal amounts of food on the table. And it is interesting to see that the group that was sleep deprived had more calorie consumption. And it is not just about calorie consumption. The type of foods that they craved for was much different. They craved for sugar rich foods. And in fact, the hormone levels of ghrelin and leptin are affected with sleep. And it even affects our diabetes control. A poor night's sleep increases the blood sugars. And there was also a, a very nice study, a global study that was done looking at the heart attacks. You know, our hearts like a good night's sleep. And when we don't sleep well, especially when the clock changes, I think this coming Sunday, we have uh, the change that happens, right? When we don't sleep well, when we sleep for one hour less globally, there is data 
to show that there is an increased incidence of heart attacks, myocardial infarctions. And when we sleep for an extra hour, that incidence of heart attacks goes down too. And most of us are familiar with the telomeres, right? The, the telomeres are the chromosomal uh, DNA at the tip of our chromosomal DNA, the cap-like structure or the aglets at the end of our shoelaces. That's how these uh, telomeres are. In general, healthier lifestyle reflects a longer telomere length and a poor lifestyle can shorten these telomeres. And no wonder they say telom uh, the, the stress can take out 10 years of our lives. But not only that, poor sleep can also shrink these telomeres and it can also affect our lifespan. And sleep plays a very significant role in creativity as well. Now, most of us would like to be creative, right? No, I'd like to share um, a, a, an example. You know, some of you are familiar with uh, Dimitri Mendeleev, right? Dimitri Mendeleev uh, is the person who developed the periodic table, right? And for a long time, Dimitri Mendeleev knew that there was a pattern in which the atoms could be arranged, but he did not know how to arrange these atoms. And there was one night, Dimitri Mendeleev had a good night's sleep. And when he slept well, guess what he saw in the dreams? He saw atoms, right? And these atoms started to arrange themselves in a particular way. And he woke up, he drew exactly what he saw in the dream. And even now, most of what he saw in the dream was, was correct. And what his waking consciousness was unable to offer him, a deep restful state offered through sleep was able to offer him. And some of you are also familiar with August Kekulé, who discovered the six carbon benzene ring, right? And again, when he was struggling with the structure of the benzene, Early in the morning, it is said that he had a dream where he saw snakes coiled, the head of one snake holding the tail of the other snake, and there were six snakes all together, and he woke up and he felt that that was the structure of the benzene ring, and even today, that is the one that is accepted. And there are many other examples in a similar way. People who played excellent piano came up with the, with the notes through something that happened during sleep, something that came to them during sleep. And there are many other things that we can talk about when we want to talk about the health benefits of sleep. And during this pandemic, it is also important to look at our own immunity levels, right? And if we look at sleep deprivation versus good night sleep, there are uh, our, our fighter cells, for example, the natural killer cells, right? The, the capacity of our natural killer cells is much more when we have a good night sleep and its activity goes down with a poor night sleep. And there is something much more important that I wanted to share. Each one of us, we have our own personality, a very unique personality for each one of us, right? And if I tell you that sleep plays a role in our personality, does that make sense? And if I tell you that it is not about sleep, but the state of mind that we are in before we go to bed at night, that plays a role, does it make sense? Let us see. You know, we have this emotional memory, right? There is an emotional state that we are in before we go to bed at night. Say we go to bed in a state of anxiety or fear or frustration or anger, maybe after an argument, for instance, right? This emotional memory gets consolidated in the hippocampus during sleep. And not only that, during sleep, this memory is slowly transferred to the prefrontal cortex and prefrontal cortex being our personality center or the reflection of our personality center and so knowingly or unknowingly we are forming our own personality based on the state of mind that we are in before we go to bed if we can change the state of mind before we go to bed perhaps we can also change the the the, the, the way in which we want to make ourselves. It is possible to become a better version of our own selves by changing the state of mind that we are in before we go to bed. And this is a paper that was published in Nature Communications that talks about how this state of mind gets consolidated during sleep and how it becomes difficult to change later on. 
And one thing that often interferes with a good night's sleep is our emotional state, right? There are many things that we go through during our daytime. Many emotional turbulences that we go through, many ups and downs that we go through, some of them pleasant and some of them not so pleasant, right? And some of these, uh, we process many emotional files during the daytime. Some of these emotional files, we process them. And some of these files, we, we put, in, put them under the carpet. We do not want to process them. We do not want to address them. Right? When we go to bed at night, the unprocessed emotional files, they do have a significant role. Sometimes they interfere with our sleep. It almost feels like there is an office assistant within that goes through these unprocessed emotional files. And it pulls out these files and says, you have not processed this file. What do you want to do with it? And sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night, not even knowing what woke us up and it becomes difficult to fall asleep. So if there is a way to remove these emotional files, if there is a way to address these emotional files, it can help a lot. One of the practices that I often um, offer our patients and the, in, patients with chronic insomnia were benefited from this practice where the evening rejuvenation technique where we, we allow these emotional files, this emotional sediment to leave the system in the form of smoke from the back top down to the tailbone, the shoulder blades, the entire back, where we sit with this idea that they're leaving the system and at the end of which we make a suggestion that there is a flow of lightness, purity or freshness entering the system, filling us up from top to toe, woozing out to each and every cell of our being. When we do that, it can facilitate a good night's sleep. It is almost as if we are wiping that windshield at the, at the end of a long overhauling ups and downs of the emotional turbulences. The second thing that I often tell my patients is this, you know, before we go to bed, it's a good practice to let go of the day. Instead of thinking about what has happened during the day and being worried about it, and instead of thinking about what's going to happen the next day and being anxious about it, settling down for a few minutes, relaxing for a few minutes, going to bed in a calmer state of mind can help. And also acknowledging the fact that with all our human limitations, there are certain things that we could work on. And when we give this little signal to ourselves before we go to bed, we are almost sending a signal to this office assistant that, you know what, this guy already knows that he messed up. There is no point in waking him up. Let him have a good night's sleep. So this is something that can be tried. And again, this is a practice that can be only experienced and see whether this is beneficial and from what I gather from my patients, this is something that has helped them. You know, something magical happens when we are in this deepest state of rest, deepest state of sleep. When we go to sleep, there are stages of sleep, right? There is stage one, stage two, and stage three. There is a time when we feel as if we are falling asleep. Then there is this deeper stage of sleep, and there is this deepest stage of sleep. And during this deepest stage of sleep, the non-REM deepest stage of sleep, stage three, we have these brain waves that are very slow. We have the delta waves, right? We call it the slow wave sleep. And something wonderful happens when these brain waves are extremely slow. Do you know what happens? The brain doesn't have the lymphatic system, but it has something called the glymphatic system. The fluid around the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, when the brain waves are very slow, actually flows through the brain clears up all the toxins that are built up during the daytime. And in fact, some of these proteins are amyloid beta and tau proteins. And we know that these proteins are somehow implicated in, in Alzheimer's disease. And now there is more and more data that are coming out that poor sleep can actually speed up the process of development of dementia. And a good night's sleep has all these benefits. And when we are awake, like each cell produces metabolic based products. Our brain also produces metabolic based products, right? Adenosine tends to build up. And look at this adenosine as, as, as piles of tiles or bricks piling up on the brain. It comes to a point where, you know what, it cannot take in anymore and it needs to go to sleep. And during sleep, slowly it is cleared up. And when we wake up, we feel refreshed. And that only happens when we have this deep state of sleep with the slow waves. Now, why am I talking about all this? 
when I'm talking about meditation, because there is some data that with, with the slow waves, the clearing up of the, of the brain happens, right? Now, what happens when we meditate? And what happens when we meditate on the heart? So this is something that I wanted to share. And this is me. I was a subject in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Reddy, who's a sleep specialist, he conducted the study and he had asked me to come if I, had, uh, if, if I was uh, interested. So I went there, I was hooked onto this EEG leads and I was asked to meditate, right? And the, the technique of meditation was meditating on the source of divine light within my heart. And I was asked to meditate and see what happened to my brain. And one thing that I often share is if I had known, I would have dressed properly, especially if I knew I was going to share this picture with everyone, right? But this is the picture that I have. And let us see what happened to my brain when I meditated, right? When I close my eyes, my initial brain waves was in an accentuated alpha rhythm and slowly transitioned to the stage one sleep pattern with, with, with the theta waves and stage two with the theta waves with the K complexes. And again, it transitioned to this slow wave pattern, the delta waves. And all this happened within 15 minutes. Normally, when we go to sleep at night, it takes about 60 to 90 minutes to get us into this slow wave sleep, right? But when I was meditating on the heart, the time that it took for the brain waves to slow down was within 15 minutes, right? And within this 15 minutes, as my brain waves slowed down, the subjective experience that I had was that of absolute stillness within. And it is almost as if one is in the deep, at, at the deepest depths of a very calm state. Normally when we are in the deepest state of sleep, our awareness is gone, right? We are not aware. But in this state, when the brain waves reflected the deepest state of rest that is produced by this deepest state of sleep, awareness was still present. But it was a thoughtless awareness where even the awareness of thoughtlessness came back a little later. So if our brain can get into this deepest state of rest within a very short period of time, when we come out of it, don't you think we feel refreshed? Don't you think we feel calm? Don't you think we feel rejuvenated? Don't you think we are better human beings? Don't you think we are kinder and be able to perform to the best possible extent? It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. And this is what in my personal experience, meditating on the heart can produce. And most of us, we would like to have a good night's sleep, right? Imagine not being able to sleep for at least three nights a week. And this goes on for months and years. We call it chronic insomnia, right? And in our hospital, we worked with patients with chronic insomnia, offered this practice for eight weeks. And this is a paper that we published in the Journal of Community Hospital Internal Medicine Perspectives. So what did we do? We offered this practice in a very simple way. This is what I told my patients. If we look at our day, it does not begin at the break of dawn. It starts the night before. Before we go to bed at night, instead of thinking about what has happened or what's going to happen the next day, settle down for a few minutes, meditate for a few minutes, do the relaxation, the heartfulness relaxation audio that we gave to the participants. And hopefully that produces a deeper and relaxed state of sleep. When we wake up in the morning, we may feel a bit refreshed. Utilize that opportunity of refreshed state. Meditate for whatever time is convenient, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. And there may be days when it is not possible to meditate, but that's okay. To the best possible extent, do it. And when we meditate in the morning, we consolidate that state of calmness. When we consolidate that state of calmness, it can help us get through the emotional turbulences, the, the, the ups and downs of our day-to-day -day life in a much better way. And having said that, each day has something or the other that gets thrown at us. We carry those stresses and strains with us. 
when I carry those stresses and strains with me, when I come home and interact with my friends, my family members, my kids, sometimes that interaction may not be very pleasant. This is what I do. I come home, I sit down, close my eyes and make a suggestion that all the complexities and impurities, the stresses and strains that I'm carrying within myself, they're leaving me in the form of smoke from the back top down to the tailbone, the shoulder blades, the entire back. And I sit with this idea for about 15 minutes or so at the end of which I feel a bit lighter. When I feel lighter, I make this suggestion that there is this flow of lightness, purity or freshness entering my heart, slowly filling me up, oozing out each and every cell of my being. In that state, it's a much better interaction with friends and family members. And at night, before we go to bed, we also do the same thing of settling down and going to bed. So these are the three practices on a daily basis that we offered our, uh, our participants. And once a week, they also meditated with me as a trainer. Most participants report a very deep calming effect with this practice. And in heartfulness, we call it the transmission effect. And what we saw after we did this for about eight weeks is this. The insomnia severity index scores came down from a mean score of 20.9 to a score of 10.4 more than a 10 point drop that we saw in the scores. This was both statistically significant and clinically significant. You know, as clinicians, we see patients on sleeping pills, right? When we offered this practice within eight weeks, with the help of supervision of a sleep specialist, we were able to wean off at 75% of the participants who were on sleeping pills. And I do not know whether they went back on it later on, but at least when we finished the study, 75% of them were able to come off of their sleeping pills. And as physicians, this has to be done under supervision and not by patients themselves. The stories that some of these patients shared, it, 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 it changed the way I looked at things. Some of my patients told me, Dr. J, I was only able to sleep for four hours before, but with the, with, the, with the eight weeks of the practice that we did, now we are able to sleep for seven hours because of which our dreams have come back. Something that I did not know before. When the participants were sleeping for a shorter duration, they were not getting into the stage where they were able to process their dreams. But as their sleep duration and the quality and the depth of sleep improved, they were able to get into the stage where they started processing their dreams. And it almost felt like their dreams have come back. And there was another study on sleep that we did in our resident physician population. This is what we did. We have uh, outpatient rotation for our residents where they go through outpatient rotation for one week and they come back to the same outpatient rotation after a few weeks. Right? At baseline, all the resident physicians went through uh, a, a baseline assessment where they filled out the consensus sleep diary. They also had an actigraphy watch that monitored their sleep patterns objectively. So we had the baseline data. When they came back again for the same rotation, we offered the heartfulness meditation practice for 20 to 25 minutes in the afternoon. And when they went to bed at night, they listened to relaxation audio. At the end of which they filled out the questionnaires and actigraphy watches recorded their sleep objectively. And this is what we found. Compared to the baseline week, during the week where they practice the meditation, their quality of sleep restfulness improved with statistical significance. The number of times they woke up came down, their sleep efficiency scores improved, and also the time to fall asleep came down from an average of 21 minutes to an average of less than 15 minutes, almost six to seven minutes was cut down in the time to fall asleep. The stories that they shared were, were also very positive. And parallel to this pandemic, right, there is also an epidemic of loneliness that's going on, right? And we wanted to see what happens to our physicians and advanced practice providers if we, if we offer the meditation. What happens to their loneliness? What happens to their sleep? Are they interrelated? One of the hypotheses that we had was very simple. A mind that is well-rested will be able to socialize well. A mind that is poorly rested will not be able to socialize. If we offer meditative practices to help with resting the mind, can that help with loneliness? 
you know loneliness is not just about not being connected with people we may be connected with hundreds of people but if that connection is not meaningful if there is no depth of that connection we can still feel lonely and even if we are connected with one person in our lives and if that connection is deep and meaningful it can act as an antidote for loneliness and we took this a step further you know what about the relationship that we have with our own selves if that inner relationship is harmonious it can also act as an antidote for loneliness and this is the hypothesis with which we went ahead and when we offered this practices for four weeks we published this in a, in a, in a journal of a hospital practice we saw that there was a significant reduction in the psqa scores in the group that meditated and there was also a significant reduction of loneliness in the group that meditated and this is a paper that we published in in the journal of hospital practice and we also presented it at the national meeting at the american conference on physician health so the question is what should we do right basics first the entire sleep rests on the time that we go to bed and the time we wake up if we can have that regulated first that is the foundation right and the second thing is our core body temperature has to drop by a couple of degrees before we fall asleep and stay asleep so if we are having trouble with sleep if there is a way we can lower the room temperature a little bit maybe by a degree or so see if that helps having a cool comfortable pillow helps our brain when it cools down it can facilitate a good night sleep and in fact there were some studies where they used cooling caps and that also facilitated a good night sleep and the third thing is electronics there is a lot of uh, uh, literature about how these electronics interfere right there was a study even before the electronic uh, the, the i uh, the, the, there was this touch phones that came phones when they are in 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 a talk mode it delays the onset of the slow wave sleep and it was very interesting to see that and if we look at the environment right my kids they're on their phones on their gadgets most of the time so i did not know what to do right so this is something that i did not how the experiment would turn out but we did what we could so we put bean sprouts in different containers we put it in different places in our house right one next to the alexa one in the kitchen one in the bedroom one uh, next to the wifi router one in 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 the meditation room and i asked kids to water them equal amounts of water and as much equal sunlight as possible but there is a difference uh, obviously because rooms are different right but nevertheless this is what we saw we saw that the way in which the beans sprouted was different in different places and the best of all was where we were meditating and the one that was next to the wifi router it almost felt like it killed those seeds our brain cells are also living something to think about and maybe we should learn to meditate too to see if that helps our sleep and that's jasper that we saw he was running around with that around his neck and that's my son rohan he was holding the book my wife took a picture her timing was perfect so this is what i wanted to share with the presentation today and what i would also like to do is to walk you through this practice see how it feels either you like it or you don't like it it's okay that is immaterial right if you like it you carry on with it if you don't like it there is much more to explore in the world than this meditation right so let me walk you through the simple guided relaxation and followed by meditation see how it feels and after that you know we'll be open for some questions okay if that's okay with uh, you dr ravi okay good go with the guided uh, relaxation meditation that uh, jay can uh, guide us through and then how long 15 20 minutes uh, how do you kind of yeah. conclude okay i don't 15 minutes and we will have questions after that okay right we will yeah thank you thank you jay excellent so please sit comfortably 
and gently close your eyes. Breathe normally. Very slowly. Move your attention to your toes. Wiggle them a little. And allow your toes to relax. Feel a very relaxing energy entering your feet from the ground, allowing your feet to completely relax. Let this energy slowly move up. Relaxing your ankles, your lower legs, the calf muscles, your knees, upper legs, and your hips. Feel all these parts completely relaxed. Let this energy slowly move up, relaxing your lower back and your upper back. Feel your entire back relaxed. Very slowly, move your attention to your abdominal area and allow all the muscles in there to relax. Move into your chest. and allow your chest to deeply relax. Move on to your shoulders. Feel them getting lighter. As if they're melting away. Let this energy slowly move into your upper arms, elbows, your lower arms, your hands, 
and your fingers. All the way to the fingertips. Slowly relax your neck. Gently loosen your jaw. Allow your chin to relax. Your lips and your eyes are very gently closed. Relax all the muscles of your face, including your forehead. Gently move into your mind and allow your mind to deeply and completely relax. Relax all the way to the top of your head and the back of your head. Gently scan your whole body from the top of your head to the tips of your toes and feel your entire body relaxed. Very slowly, move into your heart. And gently settle in there. Place your attention on the source of light within your heart. Do this in a very gentle and natural way. If your attention drifts, it's okay. It's very normal. Gently keep bringing it back to your heart. And feel as if the source of light within is attracting your attention inwards. And gently relax into that awareness.
towards the end. I will say that is all. And now let us continue to meditate.
that's all thank you you may slowly come back to the present moment and gently observe how you're feeling make a note of it mentally and very gently you may open your eyes that was a refreshing session I almost fell asleep even after having a cup of tea before. <laughs> and uh, I hope you all had the, the refreshing feeling as well. And um, any questions, please uh, come along and we'll ask them. Um, yeah, we as doctors, we know the value of good night's sleep in all kinds of health issues. And um, uh, so he also touched upon the social connection. As a matter of fact, um, social connection is so important for our well-being. And I wonder whether the meditation in a social setting has more powerful than individual uh, meditation. So is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, yes, there are, it, it has two elements. It's almost like we need to have an element of practice that we do at the comfort of our own homes that has one aspect of ourselves that, get en that gets enriched with that. When we meditate in a group, there is another aspect of ourselves that gets enriched. And when we meditate in a group, number one, it builds up that social connection. And it also gives a feeling of community. And when we travel together as a community, it makes the journey a little easier. As they say, if you want to have a long walk, if it is a long trip, travel together. And this journey is never ending. There is no limit to our refinement. So we might as well have our own friends and family who are willing to travel along with us. And we, it's okay to lean on and lean in sometimes. And that community offers that feeling that we can, uh, we offer a shoulder for someone who needs help and we may need a shoulder sometimes. So that community offers that feeling. And it is also my experience that when we meditate in a group, sometimes, it has a very unique effect and something worth exploring. Yeah, one of my good uh, psychiatric friend uh, advises the uh, patients never to worry alone or suffer alone and uh, to connect them with somebody to share their pain. And um, we all know the impact of social isolation, how uh, it has an increased risk of mortality by 43%. Social isolation is as uh, damaging to your health and wellness as a uh, smoking 15 packs of 15 cigarettes pack or lack of exercise and obesity. The flip side of it is social contagion effect. If your best friend is lives like a, within a few miles radius and his, if he's a happy person, you have a 24% likelihood of being very happy. And if your neighbor is a friend and happy, you have a 34% likelihood of being happy. That has been studied and, and published in British Medical Journal and uh, an article was written about in New York Times as well with uh, showing the clusters of people who tend to be very happy or clusters of people who tend to be miserable. So the company you keep is very important for your happiness and health as well. And uh, that's one thing to remember. Let me look at the questions here. 
Uh, and one thing I kind of also thought about when you were saying, I think we consider uh, going to sleep at the end of the day, and you put a twist to it, it's probably the beginning of the day. <laughs> and if we consider the beginning of your next day, you have a different way of thinking about your sleep and uh, prepare, preparing for sleep. Uh, And a yeah, great presentation, very relaxing. Uh, can you speak about short-term and long-term effects of mental and emotional and social lives, lives of this meditation? If you want to take that while I go through the... Sure. Yeah. You know, when I started this practice of meditation, you know, many people say that, you know, meditation, it just is fantastic. It's almost as if you're on cloud nine. It is the most relaxing and the beautiful thing that you can ever experience. Personally, that was not the case for me. You know, when I started meditating, you know, it was difficult to sit still. It was difficult to even sit down and close my eyes. And I started this practice, uh, you know, because you know, my dad, he's a professor of zoology, and he used to uh, meditate and he used to make fun of him. How can people just sit down, close their eyes and do nothing, right? And he said, you know, if this is something that you would like to explore, try it out. And he said, give it a good try for about six to eight weeks and see whether this is something that would help you. If it helps you, carry on with it. If it doesn't help you, it's okay. But when I started this practice, even the discipline of sitting down and closing my eyes was difficult. So what I did was I, I sat down, closed my eyes and meditated. I used to put a timer for about 15 minutes because that's all I could do. And as I kept doing it, there was one session when I was meditating with a, with a trainer and it was a very deep and profound meditation session. It, it felt as if my mind was removed and put in pure water and put back in again. Such an experience I never had before. And this happened within the third week or fourth week. And I cannot say that this is the standard because each one's journey is different. Each one is absolutely unique. And but something that we have learned from our studies is that within six to eight weeks, there is a tangible result of some experience of calmness, some experience of inner peace, some experience of being able to handle life in a much better way. There was another study that we recently conducted. It was a survey-based study where we had a global survey that was sent to people who were practicing meditation, we had a total of around 3,164 participants who responded. And we looked at their patterns of response to stress during pandemic. In those who were practicing for less than one year and those who were practicing for two years or more, the, the effect that we saw was that across all the dimensions that we measured, those who were practicing consistently for a little bit longer fared much better than those who were short-term meditators. And they were a little better than those who did not meditate. That's a different story. But at least we were able to show in this global study with more than 3,000 participants that there is an incremental benefit that happens with these practices of meditation. But having said that, I cannot uh, say that all meditation sessions are going to be wonderful. I'm not going to say that all meditation sessions are going to be fantastic. There may be meditation sessions where you feel as if you would want to open your eyes and walk away, right? Just because of the flow of thoughts that may be troublesome. But it is almost as if we are walking and sometimes we have good sceneries and sometimes we don't have good sceneries. It's okay. Overall, it is about moving forwards and knowing very well that the, key, the, the, the scenery keeps changing and cumulatively, slowly, the benefits tend to accumulate. And one of the fundamental benefits that I see is that with years of practice, right, our own idea of ourselves keeps changing. Our own ideas to prove our point, to have the last word, to show that one is one's ideas are superior, they slowly drop off. And when they drop off, by itself, it is a big freedom to have. 
we can perform to the best possible extent, not give too much importance to our own selves and move on. If there is something that I personally felt, you know, this is one of the benefits that I saw. Yeah, there was a, we'll, uh, we'll have a few questions. Uh, one of the questions here is, uh, I have found uh, with the anxious patient that slow deep breathing meditation works well. Your take on this as a physiological tool, Dr. Mohan has that question. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, deep breathing techniques can often help because it does affect the uh, vagal system, right? And it, it has been shown to help with anxiety. And I often also have tried when patients were very anxious, right? Uh, in fact, when I round on, on the patients, one of my previous colleagues um, shares that the person who's taking over is a meditator. So you can ask him to walk you through the meditation. And I, the patients often say, Dr. Jay, can you, uh, you know, go walk me through a technique? So I walk them through this relaxation technique. And this is also something that can be tried. So absolutely, if deep breathing technique is something that can be tried, why not go for it? Yeah, uh, I think our yoga stresses so much on breathing. Mm -hmm. as a, as a, as a medicinal breath is medicinal anyway um, any techniques to control intrusive thought Dr. Mahadeva asked that question yeah that is a, a great question you know sometimes we have these repetitive thoughts that keep coming right and sometimes it distracts us uh, from meditation you know uh, there are a few things that we can do when we are meditating and if this intrusive thought keeps coming again and again and again, and if we are unable to carry on with meditation, it's okay. Accept the fact. You may open your eyes and try again or take a few deep breaths and see if that helps. If it doesn't help and if this intrusive thought keeps coming back again and again and again, right? Sit with an idea that, you know what? whatever happens, I'm just gently going to rest my attention on something good within my own heart. Let us call it a source of light. Just that idea that I'm settling down into that state, allowing whatever unfolds in that state, that can be helpful. And in spite of all this, it is difficult to meditate. It's okay, we get up, we take a walk, we take a good book, read. Uh, Jay, you might like this uh, compliment. Thank you, Jay. You just like your dad. You've done a wonderful job. Lax Nomula. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and Dr. Arora said, um, I always recommend a gratitude journal at bedtime. Um, any thoughts on that? Yes. You know, um, our brain is almost like a garden. There are plants that we would like to cultivate and there are weeds that we want to remove, right? You know, within the brain, there are some cells, the microglial cells, they are the cleanup cells. They clean up anything that is unwanted. And do you know how the brain knows what is unwanted and what is wanted? There are three things. Attention, intention, and attitude. The state of mind that we are in before we go to bed plays a role. When we go to bed in a state of gratitude, right? We are paying attention towards a positive state. Our intention is that of gratitude and our attitude is humility, right? And now we are sending a signal that this is the plan that we would like to cultivate. Yeah. And when we are in that state, we are not paying attention to negativity. And you know something that's very interesting, there is a molecule called C1Q. Whatever we do not pay attention to, this molecule called C1Q goes and latches onto that synaptic connection and prunes it off. If we do not pay attention to negativity, the C1Q, it's almost like, you know, the trees that are cut, right? There is a mark that is placed and the tree is cut off. The C1Q plays that role. And because we are not paying attention to negativity, it gets marked and the microglial cells slowly clean it off. Our system is so beautifully designed and it listens to us. The suggestions that we give for our own selves, the attitude with which we live our lives is what shapes us. 
more than anything else. And with the, with the, with the practices of the meditation that I've been talking about, it is all about cultivating an attitude of healthy living, an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of being uh, connected to something that is much more calmer within our own selves that is still within our own selves. And this can play a significant role in which, through which we can lead our lives in a reasonable way. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Chinomla made a comment that uh, United Kingdom had a Ministry of Loneliness and as a, in 2019, they did. And actually Japan now also followed the suit in 2020, February, they also started a Ministry of Loneliness to create programs to connect people, social programs, for especially for the elderly and uh, disabled people who have a lack, a lack of resources to connect. Actually, those problems are much more severe in our culture and our society because our uh, suburban culture, uh, we have a lack of public transportation. We have uh, lack, of, lack of equity issues, transportation equity, housing equity, access equity, so many things. I think probably we need to look into that. I think. Um, our Surgeon General has written a book about uh, loneliness and connections and all those. I think if we focus on those social aspects of connection and and uh, uh, kind of uh, being there for each other kind of will help a lot. And I think this has been an amazing session as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we can conclude it. And uh, 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 do we have the plaques, uh, the virtual plaques, uh, Vijaya? So uh, Dr. Uh, Ravi, just a yeah. couple of questions about uh, from uh, just you know, uh, you know, is there any kind you know contraindication for meditation? Uh, J.R. Kunal, one of you can answer. Is meditation benefit uniformly across various types of personality, or any contraindication or type that does not fit? And the other question is, if we go to sleep, still it is effective. Let's say if you fall asleep during meditation, is it still useful? So please address them before we conclude. Let's Dr. Grandi, and he yeah. was my friend, uh, you know, during uh, Kaplan times before residency in uh, Detroit. The other one is Dr. Um, Krish Sondarajan is asking about any contraindication and what type of, uh, you know, does it benefit all types and personalities? You know, let me take up the sleep one before Kunal takes it up. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when we meditate, we do fall asleep. It is not uncommon. You know, it is still beneficial. It only shows that your body needs some sleep. And if your body needs that sleep, take it. And even if we go to sleep during meditation, we come out a little bit better because during the deep state of sleep, there are many chores that the body is due for. And the body does those chores. Give that opportunity for the body to get those chores done. How long do we want to carry those chores undone, right? Sleep can allow our system to get those chores done, whether it happens during meditation or whether it happens naturally, let it happen. But as we pay off our sleep debt or meditation, we, we begin to experience that meditative state, which is distinct. Because the deepest state of rest with that awareness is, is one of the most beautiful states to experience. And people call about it as a state of bliss. I would agree with that because it is, it is, it is beyond what we normally experience as calmness. It is that in the innermost depth of calmness anyone can experience. All right, and, a couple of uh, quite, uh, before Kunal goes, there are a lot of compliments to Jay. Jay is a great, uh, speaker and they want him back again. I have some good news, we'll share that with you. Actually, there'll be some follow-up program. Uh, we are going to have, uh, Chandra, you want to announce that or? <clears throat> right, you know, the as a follow-up, if, um, if, if anyone is interested to practice this meditation, uh, this is called heartfulness meditation and this is free of cost. There is never, a, there is, will never be a charge to this service. And all this program is, uh, run by the volunteers. Jay is a volunteer, Konal is a volunteer, myself is a volunteer. So, you know, as a follow up, what, what we were talking to Ravi and uh, Dr. Anupama is to have a, an exclusive session for RP membership. You know, an hour a day, I mean, an hour on a Sunday, once a week for the next four weeks. 
So at about 10 o'clock Eastern time, we can start doing this. Even we can offer it tomorrow if um, Dr. Ravi is ready for that. Yeah, we're not sure, but um, yeah, there'll be some follow-ups. So you'll be getting email not a, emails in our newsletter. Please look for them. You'll also be getting uh, uh, pre and post uh, evaluation questionnaires for CME. So let's conclude the talk. I know we can go on for a long time uh, with the plaques and uh, some commendation to our speakers. Um, can we display the plaques, please? Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Anupama Gautimukla, our president is on the road to Houston to meet uh, Consul General. So I have the privilege to present the plaque to Dr. Kunal Desai for his outstanding contribution to integrative medicine and welcome him as a member of the API Distinguished Speakers Club. Uh, uh, signed by Dr. Anupama Gautimukla, the president of API and uh, Amit Chakravarti, our uh, chair of the CME. March 20. 12th, 2022, um, Oak Brook, Illinois. So let's display the next plaque for our next speaker. And uh, again, it's my distinct privilege to present to J. Timapuram, MD, MRCP for his outstanding contributions to the integrative medicine and welcome him as a member of OPI Distinguished Speakers Club signed by Dr. Anupama Gautimukla, president of API, and uh, Amit Chakravarti, the chairman of the CME programs this year, March 12th, 2022, Oak Brook, Illinois. And uh, again, um, thank you again for everyone to pass. We have a good turnout, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's a worthwhile uh, time spent. Uh, is very uh, it's deeply more. rewarded and richly rewarded. Uh, thank you for all of you. So, uh, Dr. Ravi, huh? just one quick announcement. You know, there is going to be, a, uh, you know, CME session uh, organized by Heartfulness in the month of October. It's uh, titled Empowering Healers. Healers. Saturday, October 22nd, 2022, 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. and eight hours of uh, CME. Similar lectures. I can display the the website if if, if, if that's okay. Um, and uh, these are the speakers. Uh, you know, the Dr. Doty, Jay, and Kunar will be there, and others. These are all nationally renowned speakers. It's going to be in October of this year. Please, if you are interested, please participate. All right. Thank you again, and we'll uh, conclude our great session. And uh, have a great day. Uh, stay well and stay safe. Good day. Is it Dr. Sharada Gupta who wanted to ask something? So can we have a recording of this? Uh, uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be posted on our website. Uh, there's the webinars in the web, under the webinar tab.